This is a production of Cornell University. Thanks so much to Don and for everybody here uh, and also in Geneva. Look at that turnout in Geneva. Thank you guys so much uh, for coming out <laughs> all the way. Um, I, I just want to reiterate something that Don said, that this is a truly fabulous award. And um, I think anybody who has any interest in doing travel after they graduate or can think of um, a project that involves travel as part of your, of part of your graduate uh, education, I think it's a really fantastic opportunity. And uh, I was personally very excited to get this. So um, I'm also really excited to talk to you today about my experience in Tasmania. So where are we going? <laughs> um, we are going to Tasmania. And I'm going to start by introducing my research a little bit to give you a little bit of a context about why I even went to Tasmania to begin with. Um, move into an introduction to Tasmania, kind of give you a whirlwind tour through pictures of the state, uh, and then talk about the research that I did in Tassie. Um, and then hopefully at the end, I'll have time for some questions. And the pictures that are accompanying the slides aren't always completely uh, topical about what's on the slide, but I, you know, it's hard when you have so many pictures and you want to show off uh, the beauty of a place. So enjoy the pictures and also try to look at the uh, data that's on the slides if you can. <laughs> um, so I'm going to start off by talking about sour rot. And this is the disease that I work on uh, as part of my PhD project. And when I arrived at Cornell in 2013, uh, sour rot was a very poorly understood disease. We didn't really understand what caused it, how it spread, uh, where it even was in the world. But we did know that it typically develops on uh, tight clustered, thin skinned varieties of grapes. We start to see a discoloration starting at about 15 bricks. And then really the characteristic of the disease is that we smell vinegar really emanating from these clusters. Um, wounds appear to exacerbate the rot, and then we start to see damaged berries ooze, and we see Drosophila, or fruit flies, swarming around the clusters. And uh, so far, we've seen it in New York, Ontario, Oregon, Washington, California, and then also reports of it in France and Portugal. And you can see here, this is a picture of sour rot on uh, Pinot Noir. And Spoiler alert, this is from Tasmania, so it turns out I did find it there, which uh, was very good for my research. This is a particularly disgusting picture of sour rot. Um, if, in, if you leave it alone and let it do its thing, and I'm sorry for the horticulturists in the room, the pathologists, we just love this kind of stuff. So this is truly a disgusting example of, of sour rot. So some of the questions that I've asked as part of my PhD research are what are the identities of the microorganisms that cause sour rot? What is the epidemiology of the disease? What is the role of vinegar flies or fruit flies? And then also, is sour rot found in other cool climate viticultural regions? Which is what brings me to Tasmania. So where is Tasmania? So I was asked a lot of times uh, if I was going to Tanzania. And no, in fact, I did not go to Africa. I went to Australia. Um, and so Tasmania is this nice little state down here at the bottom of Australia. Um, and it is very much unlike the rest of Australia in a lot of ways. Um, so kind of form a picture of what you think of, of Australia in your mind. And then I'll venture into some pictures and you can see the contrast. It's just a very different um, place than the images we have in our mind of kangaroos bouncing through, you know, Ayers Rock or uh, Uluru in the background. Um, just a very different place. And so here is the state of, uh, of Tasmania. And down at the bottom, we have Hobart, which is the capital, which is where I was primarily based. And the other major city in the state is Launceston, which is up in the northern part. And uh, I'm going to kind of give you, this is your whirlwind photo tour of the state. So we're going to go in this counterclockwise fashion. Um, and you'll get to see some beautiful shots of of the state and um, hopefully kind of give you a taste for what Tasmania looks like and um, just kind of give you this, this feeling for the place that I tried to get over my five months there. So starting out just east of, of Hobart here, um, dolerite is the type of rock um, that forms these amazing formations. And it's actually a type of igneous rock um, it's made of, it was magma, 
that rose out of the center of the earth when Tasmania was separating from Gondwana. So this was a really amazing kind of event, obviously, in the history of our earth. And when Tasmania was one of the last pieces to break off right before Antarctica broke off of Gondwana, and when it did, these massive formations literally came out of the center of the earth and formed these coastline, these rock formations on the coastline that are like nothing else I've ever seen in my life. Um, just truly phenomenal and uh, just, you know, covering these coastlines. You can see them in the background um, and you can also hike out on top of them. Um, there's, un like, Tasmania is a, is a state that, I mean, it's an, it's an island, right? So water dominates everything around it. Um, but just this vastness of um, very few people actually living there. There's only half a million people on the entire island and this really vast space and completely gorgeous beaches. Uh, you can see from the white sand beaches that it's primarily quartz that has um, made these white sands and gorgeous waters. Now, it is unlike a lot of the rest of Australia where it is, this is cool climate. So <laughs> I was there in the summertime, it did get hot. Um, we were, it was a drought year, um, but usually, I mean, it does get cold. When, by the time I left um, in, at the end of May, it was down to 33, 34 degrees. Uh, we got a frost. I mean, it was, uh, it was cold. <laughs> and so not really what you would think of normally when you think of Australia. So this is the northeastern coast. We're kind of moving up towards Launceston at this point. And uh, this is the type of unbelievable land formations that you see when you go out hiking uh, mountains and on also uh, these white sand beaches. And uh, this is the first of a few isthmuses <laughs> that I'm going to show you photos of. Uh, and so the, the kind of bay on your right is called Wine Glass Bay uh, and just a really picturesque setting. Um, and again, with these unbelievable rock formations and some of this, you know, a lot of the the landscape of Tasmania was formed um, through a lot of periods of glaciation, um, mountains being formed and then uh, being covered by water and then the water receding. Um, and so just a really carved out and diverse um, geography. And so as we move into the center of the state, it starts to look extremely different. You see this uh, low-lying brush and this portion of the state, which is at really high altitude, um, it's very harsh climate. So we're looking at cold, damp, uh, very um, swampy. I mean, you can see this is in the middle of the state where we're not near the ocean at this point and um, lots of standing water and just un like just very interesting rock formations and low-lying brush, but still mountains. And so uh, these are the types of, I just, I have to include these types of views because they're spectacular and it really just gives a, a, a view of what Tasmania has to offer in terms of just unbelievable beauty. And being from Oregon originally, I mean, this was, I'm into this, this is gorgeous and wonderful hiking. Um, and wombats, uh, which I know I can't show pictures of Australia without showing um, pictures of its creatures. And so wombats are hilarious and they're often uh, in these sort of low plain areas, um, digging holes and being hilarious and can't, they are not deterred, they don't care about people at all. They just dig their holes and eat all day long. Um, this is Cradle Mountain, which is a beautiful uh, spot in the center of Tasmania. Um, just unbelievable peaks. And then this really interesting vegetation where you almost see palm-like trees in the center. And as we move uh, kind of into the southwest part of the state, um, this is all World Heritage Area. And so really, you this is all park land. There's no one who lives in this part of the state at all. It's all um, really uh, un like a pretty amazing hiking trails, backpacking trails. Um, and uh, this part is a dammed area uh, which has formed this lake. Um, and this is literally where the roads end in the southwest and so you can't drive any further than this. If you want to continue down into the southwest part of the state, you're looking at a seven to ten day backpacking trip down to the ocean. And this little guy in the front is a spotted coal. Um, he's quite adorable. K or Q U O L L. 
a tiny marsupial. Um, and then as we head back towards Hobart, we start to see just a really stark change in vegetation, almost jungle-like, um, with palm trees and huge ferns. Also, um, dolomite caves, not dolerite, but dolomite caves are pretty prevalent. And uh, also home to platypus, which I never saw, so I still have no proof that they really exist. And then back to the isthmus uh, on Bruni Island, which is only about an hour outside of Hobart. Um, and just some, this is where Captain Cook originally arrived when he uh, came to this part of the world, um, and just spectacular views. And just to reiterate, Tasmania is cold for a lot of parts of the year, so this is me backpacking, and I do indeed have a lot of clothes on because it was rainy and chilly and uh, uh, so worth it as well. And so this is a view from top of Mount Wellington, which is in Hobart, and this is looking over Hobart. And the haziness that you see here is from the controlled burns of the eucalyptus um, that the firefighters were in charge of doing. Um, and that's because the seeds of the eucalyptus require fire uh, in order to germinate. So, um, but by the time the end of, or the winter was approaching, uh, these controlled burns were going almost all the time. And we're back in Hobart now, and this is Mount Wellington, and again with the dolerite um, uh, pipes. Is it a little less red in that? Is it a little less red there, or is that just the light? Uh, no, I mean, it's, I think it might just be the light, to be honest, but there is like a redness in those rocks that is pretty, pretty phenomenal. And then the wallabies. I can't not show a wallaby. And these guys are everywhere, and basically think about deer and how deer are everywhere <laughs> in Ithaca. Um, the wallabies and the smaller cousin, the patty melons, those are everywhere as well and on campus at the University of Tasmania hopping around. And so here is Hobart uh, from Mount Wellington and uh, we see, so if you were to look down in this part, uh, this is where the University of Tasmania campus is, so not too shabby looking over the ocean there. So Hobart ha itself has a really rich um, but also very conflicting past um, with uh, completely wipe, there was a complete wipeout of the Aboriginal population when the U Europeans arrived, and so it's a quite devastating um, history to learn about. And then also, um, ta all of Tasmania was a penal colony, and so the island itself was the prison, um, and so a lot, and I would say most of the uh, older buildings were convict built including um, my little house that I lived in down there in the corner. Um, that was uh, built by convicts in the 1880s. And um, so just the history is very, is everywhere, <laughs> very prevalent. Um, also for an, from an agricultural standpoint, there is a rich history of apple growing. Um, and a lot of uh, Southern Tasmania has apple orchards and um, just a lot of, and quince quince and apples and, and a lot of interesting um, history involving that type of farming. And then also, and then more recently, um, a move into grapes. So I was based at the University of Tasmania and I worked primarily with Kathy Evans who was based at the Hobart campus, but I also worked with Fiona Kerslake who was a junior research fellow um, up in Launceston in the northern part of the state. And so I kind of split my time between the two of them but was primarily based, um, that's my lab was at, was in Hobart at the UTAS campus, um, and I worked a lot with Kathy. So the major viticultural areas in Tasmania, um, I've highlighted them here, um, but the three that I worked in primarily were the Coal River Valley, the Derwent Valley, and the Tamar Valley. And the Tamar Valley you can see up near Launceston, the Coal River Valley, and the Derwent Valley down near Hobart. So this is where I primarily split my time. And in the Coal River Valley, I worked with two commercial vineyards. The Derwent Valley was one, uh, and in the Tamar Valley, two other commercial vineyards. And this was all organized by Fiona and Kathy, which I was just so grateful <laughs> that they were able to do some groundwork for me. So in terms of northern Tasmania, um, while I was there, there was a series of brush fires that uh, started right well, a couple weeks after I arrived. Um, and persisted for a big portion of the time that I was there. And so you can see on the left-hand side, that's my view from one of the vineyards that I was working in, and you can see the burning happening and the big plumes of smoke. 
and then this, uh, the orange skies at night in Launceston were from the brush fires as well. And though there was a lot of conversation about smoke taint and how it would impact wine quality, um, and there was a lot of research going on at that time um, by Fiona actually uh, about how the brush fires were going to impact the wine quality. So I don't know, I haven't heard from her lately, but I had heard that people were feeling pretty hopeful about it, that there wasn't a lot of damage to the grapes um, in the end. And then um, the Hobart area in Coal River Valley um, was going through, a th I mean, the whole state was going through a drought, um, but Coal River Valley was uh, visibly <laughs> drier than whenever I was up in the Tamar Valley. The Tamar Valley, a lot uh, more humid um, and just a lot muggier, whereas a lot drier down in Coal River. And um, from a viticultural standpoint, I mean, viticulture, um, in uh, in Tasmania looked sig looked very familiar to me. <laughs> there wasn't a lot of differences in terms of training systems or tra trellising. Um, looked very very similar to what we were used to, what I was used to. Um, the, a lot of VSP trained vines. Um, they, everything was irrigated and um, just very familiar uh, uh, viticultural techniques because a lot of them have been brought over by the Europeans originally. And so in terms of my three research components, um, I'm going to start talking about just these three, the aluminum sequencing component, uh, looking at sour rock ca causal organisms, and then also the environmental effects. So uh, the question that kind of guided this, uh, the aluminum sequencing component was ep what epiphytic microbes are present on the grape surface? So I have three years of data um, on this topic from the Finger Lakes, and I wanted to also expand this to Tasmania. And so uh, my goal here is to understand the presence and changes in yeast and bacteria over the course of the growing season. And how I did this, um, and one of the reasons that I needed to arrive so early in the growing season in Tasmania was because I worked in five commercial vineyards and did um, uh, DNA extractions on grapes starting at pea-sized berries, so very early on in the season, and then took samples at pea-sized bunch closure, berets in 15 bricks, and at harvest, and then uh, used amplicon sequencing with ITS and 16S primers um, to amplify fungal and bacterial DNA. So um, it was a, it's a huge project, <laughs> and unfortunately, because of it being a big project, I do not have data to show you on that, but it is going into a very large paper um, that we are we're working on. And um, I'm excited that the research from the Dreer is going to go into a paper that will be um, out next year. So, well, I see Lance over there, so fingers crossed that it'll be out next year. So, um, the next question that I wanted to answer is: Is sour rot found in Tasmania? And obviously, I already. Uh, answered or spoiled it for everybody, and yes, it is in fact found in Tasmania. Um, this is an echidna, by the way, and he was hanging out in the vineyard and amazing, so cute. Um, so in terms of sour rot incidence and severity, um, I took uh, incidence and severity ratings every five days until harvest um, at a commercial vineyard in Hobart, and this was just, uh, it was a vineyard uh, actually that my husband was working at at the time um, and he said hey we have sour rot here because fortunately I have trained him very well to recognize uh, sour rot symptoms um, and so I went out there and every five days I took uh, disease and incidence ratings um, and here are some of the examples of the fruit that I found from there so and uh, if we look at those incidence and severity ratings we see an exponential increase in the uh, amount of disease in this field. And you know, part of this is that there is so little education um, of these sorts of disease on these sorts of disease symptoms, and also there are very few um, tools available uh, to growers for sour rot, um, partially because there, there aren't uh, any real labeled products for it, especially not in terms of insecticides, so there's nothing to target the Drosophila. So once the disease starts, um, it progresses exponentially. And we really see this is a, a huge amount of disease um, to the point where the grower really was dropping the fruit on the ground um, underneath of the vines. And I tried to, part of the education was telling him, don't uh, drop the fruit under the vines because uh, if the disease being spread uh, by Drosophila, the Drosophila are going to continue breeding in your grapes and then go up into the canopy and spread it more, which is exactly what it did. 
Um, and uh, so it was an educational process for me as well, just to know that uh, you know, these are the types of um, measures that needed to be communicated as well. Remove that fruit from the vineyard, get it out of there. Don't let it sit underneath those vines and continue spreading the disease. Um, that's a Tasmanian devil, uh, <laughs> just in case you guys were wondering about uh, whether they were there. They are indeed. Um, you can talk about them for two seconds and then get back to science. Um, that they, uh, somebody asked me about this earlier, um, so they do suffer from a facial tumor um, that uh, has been devastating their population in Tasmania, but there are several breeding programs which have been very successful at reintroducing um, uh, resistant devils uh, back into the wild, and they've been doing really, really well. They've had huge success, and actually um, I saw one while uh, backpacking um, out on an island. One like wandered up to the campsite and was a little too friendly for my liking, but um, yeah, so they are there and they're very cute. Um, so uh, we, one question we really wanted to know about sour rot was are uh, there the same causal organisms for sour rot in Tasmania as there are here? Um, and basically what we know about that is that we require yeast and bacteria and fruit flies in order to cause sour rot. And was that the same answer? As, or it, were, are those the same causes as in Tasmania? And so what I did was I washed, took a wash of three berries on each of 10 clusters from six vineyards, um, played them out, and then uh, sent two reps of each for sequencing. And what I found was very encouraging. So yes, these are very consistent with what we, uh, what we see in the US and in the Finger Lakes, is that yeast um, is present in very high quantities, um, as well as uh, acetic acid bacteria, which is what we had been crossing our fingers for, um, but also we found. So we were very, very happy to see that uh, the yeast and bacteria were present in the samples, and that these are the same, um, these are the same species that we see here in the Finger Lakes as well. So no big surprises, but also very exciting to see for the first time that we can tie uh, the sour rot in Tasmania to sour rot here. So in terms of environmental factors, um, we're, we were looking at whether we um, could put some hobo data loggers out into the field and take measurements every 10 minutes for uh, 11 days and track uh, temperature, dew point, relative humidity, a whole bunch of environmental factors and see if we could uh, correlate them with sour rot symptoms. And what we found at that same um, vineyard in um, outside of Hobart, where I had the uh, very high levels of incidence and severity of sour rot, is that I was uh, able to correlate um, maximum daily dew point uh, very well with uh, my severity ratings, um, which just meant that it gave me a jumping off point to when I returned to uh, the Finger Lakes that we could further study the, um, like, further study temperature and relative humidity, and maybe there was a correlation there that we wanted to look further at. Um, and uh, kind of conversely, uh, in another vineyard where I suspected there would be sour rot, but there didn't end up being any, we saw that opposite uh, trend. So there was a downward trend of maximum daily dew point. Um, and this was sort of just a jumping off point for us to delve deeper into the environmental conditions um, that would be uh, causing susceptibility. And the last component uh, just that I think is very important and I kind of touched on a little bit was I worked a lot with growers when I was down there to educate uh, both the growers and the crews um, about how to identify sour rot and how to manage it. Um, there are a lot of backpackers down there who work in vineyards um, to support their traveling, <laughs> and a lot of them have never worked in agriculture, uh, let alone vineyards. And so they're seeing grapes for the first time, they're harvesting grapes for the first time, um, and so there's a ton of education to do, and also the crew changes every year. So it's a brand new group of people. And so talking to the vineyard managers about sour rot and how to educate their crews on it was a really big factor in what I was uh, there to do. And um, I think it was, it was a really educational process, I think, for a uh, very great educational experience for both me and for them, um, just to understand what they had available to them and what sort of viticulture techniques they could use um, when they didn't have uh, the spray um, management techniques available to them. 
So I want to thank, uh, there's so many people to thank, but the Frederick Deer Award uh, itself uh, is, as I mentioned before, just such a fantastic opportunity and I encourage other graduate students to apply for it. Um, as well as the award committee members, uh, Anita Busek, Mervyn Pritz, and Josh Serra. Um, my uh, collaborators at University of Tasmania, as well as Tasmanian grape growers, and the ones I uh, listed here were um, the uh, vineyard managers primarily at these various uh, wineries and vineyards that I worked with, and of course my PI, Wayne Wilcox, for allowing me to spend six months to go to Tasmania, and I feel like I really brought back a lot of very valuable data um, that we're going to be able to put right into paper, so looks looks good for everybody. So with that, I will take questions. Yeah, so the question was, are there any viticultural techniques that the farmers are using that are effective against sour rot? Um, so that was, that was tricky because we, I think part of the problem was when I went down there originally, I didn't even know if we were going to see sour rot. So it was a big question mark up until the point where I actually saw sour rot in those vineyards. Um, and so I was kind of observing their practices and seeing if I could point out anything to them. Um, but I think what we continually talk about is how to loosen clusters. Um, and so leaf pulling techniques and um, any measures that you can do from a viticulture standpoint to reduce the compactness of clusters. Because that's really what does it, is when those berries are pushing up against each other and they're forming wounds, it's an entry point for yeast and bacteria um, and for fruit flies to lay eggs. And so um, kind of reducing that cluster compaction was a really big deal. And How can that be done? So primarily leaf pulling in the early season. Um, I mean, that's been the most effective technique. Um, yeah, but you have to be really on top of it. You have to be very vigilant, and you have to be pretty dedicated to it because leaf pulling requires a crew. Um, I mean, you can do it with a machine, but a lot of people don't have uh, mechanized leaf pullers to just put on to their tractors. Um, so it's very expensive either way. Um, but it is a technique that people have used in the past, and it's well-researched, and there's a lot of literature about it. Um, but that was the biggest thing um, that I could recommend to people because there weren't, um, and it was all for next year, right? So this is, it's <laughs> made it even harder because I'm standing there going, well, there's nothing really that you can do now um, except for remove this fruit from your vineyards. Um, but next year, think about leaf pulling. Think about uh, really reducing that cluster compaction to the best of your abilities. No. So the question was about thicker, thick skin versus thin skin varieties and whether um, viticulturists are switching to thicker skin varieties uh, to avoid the disease. And uh, no, not really. So the problem is, is that thin skin varieties are primarily grown in cool climate viticulture areas uh, because of the ripening issue that you need to get the fruit ripe. And thicker skin varieties are more, they take longer to ripen. And so it's kind of a, you're in a tight spot where you can't pick to, uh, switch so much to the thicker skin varieties because they're going to be more difficult to ripen. Um, so no, we're not really seeing that. I think some people are, um, at least here in the Finger Lakes, um, Pinot Noir is a difficult grape to grow, um, period. It's, a, it's, it's difficult and it has trouble ripening here. And then on top of it, it is very susceptible to sour rot. So in talking to several growers in the area, I know that some people are just, they've had it with, with Pinot. <laughs> like it's one of those things where they're, they're not gonna go through the trouble of growing it anymore to then have it, you know, uh, get sour rot a week before harvest and then not even be able to harvest it at all. So there's, there's conversations going on, but at a very small kind of micro level <laughs> at this point. Um, yeah, switching. And then also from, from a viticultural standpoint, regrafting your vines is a huge costly undertaking. Um, and so most people don't have that option. It's more just managing the vines that you already have. Yeah. Yeah, so the question was whether I have guesses as to the sequence of events of yeast bacteria Drosophila. Um, oh, gosh, as I drop my microphone. Um, so yes, we do have guesses. So um, we have found yeast on the surface of the grapes from a very early point in the season. And I think that's a, it's a generally accepted idea in the wine industry that there is yeast that is coming in on the surface of grapes. 
Um, the question is, where is the acetic acid coming from that's forming the vinegar? Um, and so, uh, yeah, the alumina is, that's kind of the role there is trying to address where this bacteria is coming from. We know that fruit flies themselves, they eat yeast, they eat acetic acid bacteria, um, so it's on their bodies. So they are, they could be vectoring it, right? They could, they could be the instigators, um, but it could also just be on the surface of the grapes them itself. And there could be something to do with the flies, um, something to do with an enzyme that could be sp speeding up the process. Or um, as they liquefy the um, pulp of the grapes, perhaps that's helping to speed along the process. Um, and so, yeah, that is sort of the, that is the big question that still has left, we have to, we have to address before I can be done with my PhD is sort of what is the sequence? Because um, that's everybody's question, and it's my question too. So <laughs> um, we're we're getting there. Yeah, I hope to know sometime soon. Yeah. So the question was whether the uh, sort of epiphytic microorganisms change from vineyard to vineyard in different regions, and, um, and so that's the role. That's kind of what the Illumina sequencing, the aim of that. Um, that's basically that's the aim of that side of the project is to understand whether it. It changes not only over the course of the season, but from site to site. Um, I mean, the whole idea of terroir in winemaking is that every single site, um, it, that's what affects um, the wine quality and the wines that are produced out of there. So one would think that that would you know, be affected by the microorganisms that were specific to that site. Um, so far, we see a lot of the same yeast at every site, um, you know, there's there's like a top five yeasts <laughs> that we, we see everywhere. Um, the questions are whether they change in quantity and how those are affected by different environmental conditions um, and over the course of the season. So I'm really hoping that that, that paper is going to address some of that. Yeah, thanks, Beth. Oh, um, so the question is whether there's an epicenter for where sour rot originated. Um, and no, I don't think, because it's not, I'm not dealing with a traditional pathogen. Um, I don't work with, you know, one, a causal organism that is traditionally considered a plant pathogen. We're dealing with yeast and bacteria which are just in the environment. So I think instead of there being an epicenter of the disease, it's more like the environmental conditions that give rise to the disease. Um, so it's, it's more of a question of what are, um, you know, obviously cool climate viticulture um, with thinner, thin skin varieties and where there might be more humidity um, or higher humidity and uh, rains near harvest, that's where you're going to see more sour rot because those are the conditions that yeah. give rise, yeah, exactly, that are conducive to sour rot as opposed to be there being an origin of the disease. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. So the question was about whether, um, was, you know, before I went, the <coughs> disease wasn't on a lot of people's radars, and so now that I'm not there anymore, what, uh, what, things are in place to help growers kind of manage this disease or, or talk about it. Um, there isn't a lot. There is no extension system like we have here. Uh, I mean, the, the researchers work with growers, but there's no formal system where they have an appointment to go and, you know, they have to spend X amount of time out there talking to growers. There is an active grower community. They are interested in, um, they're interested in learning and they talk to each other a lot amongst each other, um, but there isn't anything, no formal structure available to them to meet up and, and have these conversations. I think a lot of, <laughs> a lot of growers uh, that I worked with just said, well, we've never seen this before, it'll probably never happen again. And I'm going like, oh gosh, well, I really hope I didn't personally cause sour rot for the only <laughs> year that I happened to be there. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm hoping that it'll just be, I think it'll just be something that happens naturally over time that the growers are going to have to have those conversations because it's, the problem isn't gonna go away. This is, it, I can guarantee it wasn't a fluke. Um, and I think it's just gonna have to happen between themselves. Um, but because there, are so, there aren't any tools for them to use in terms of uh, insecticide spray, which is gonna be the most effective tool that they can use. So. Um, people are going to have to get creative, but no, there's not a formal structure for allowing that to happen, which is really, it's really unfortunate. Yeah. yeah. Well, if there are no further questions, Megan, thank you so much. Thank you, guys. <laughs> 
This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.